I wanted to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, this is 2013, so this marks the second decade that I've known Sri Srinivasan. I met him actually on the first day of my of orientation when I started at uh, Columbia University at the School of Journalism. And he had just also just gotten his degree, and he'd been hired, I believe, on a one-year contract to, to, to teach. And so I couldn't believe, as somebody who wanted to explore the world and become an adventurer as a journalist, that this guy got a degree from one of the best universities and, and journalism schools in the world, and he decided he wanted to stay put and turn things around for other students. Um, but in the end, uh, what he did was an incredible investment um, in terms of being able to stay put in one place and help build an institution. And Shri very much is a poster child for what we do with our communication leadership program. He did two things. He first of all became an, an accomplished educator, uh, very generous with both his time and just sharing with people and bringing them along as journalism began to really transform and change as the business models were, were radically being turned upside down. And equally important, he became uh, a hugely powerful influencer. He built this amazing network. If Malcolm Gladwell had written The Tipping Point, uh, if he'd known of Sri at the time, he would have probably included Sri in the book as a, as a maven, as somebody who knows how to connect the dots and bring people together. And those two things, sharing content, creating and sharing content, and, and building networks around it is the, the, the bottom line to what we do in our program here. So when Sri called me and said he was going to be in Seattle for the first time since 1999 to work with MSN and offered his services, we said, yeah, we should definitely have him uh, provide an event, uh, and Sri does really amazing sort of hands-on type workshops to share with you, our community. So I'm really grateful that he has done this. Um, and now, he, you know, he's gone from being the assistant dean of students at Columbia University Journalism School to their first chief digital officer. For many of you as journalists, you've been experiencing the upheaval for the last 10 years in your business model. Universities are facing it now, and so Sri has gone from one industry in crisis to another, uh, to, to figure things out for online education and generally for technology at the Columbia University, and we're also doing that here. So thank you all for coming. I want to quickly pass it to Sri, who's going to invite another person on stage, and then we'll get going. Right. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Let's give Hanson Hossein a big round of applause. And he's at HRH Media, and I'm going to ask Monica Guzman to come join us. Let's put microphones up there. Yeah. So Monica, uh, you all, I think, know here in Seattle. Monica is at the Seattle Times. She's a freelancer and uh, very active with SPJ. And uh, she's kind of one of the best people on social media. So we asked her to kind of join us here for this unusual format. And what we want to do is have a conversation about social media. And um, here we are in Seattle, you know, home of so much technology, and we're going to try and uh, talk about social. Somebody said, boy, you got a lot of nerve. You're going to go to Seattle and teach them about technology? There's no way. In fact, uh, someone predicted no one would show up, but you all did, and I appreciate that. Uh, in New York, and then somebody in New York was very upset, because in New York, we charge $150 at Columbia for this same event. And uh, I said, you know, I couldn't charge that in Seattle. I'd have to pay people to come to something like this. So 10 bucks for a great cause. And uh, one of the things that I want to underline here is the importance of those scholarships for SPJ, AAJA, SAJA, all these organizations. And uh, if you find value in what we do here tonight, more than the $10, I hope you will uh, be generous and, and write a bigger check, perhaps, to those institutions. And then I also want to give a shout out to the program here, which has been rebranded as at Com Lead under uh, Hansen's leadership. Uh, they're doing a lot. So if you want to write a check to Hansen and his program, you, you can do that. Just as, apply to the program. <laughs> or just apply to the program and, 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 and go attend. Uh, first, let me just go to Monica. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on with social uh, what, are, what are the things that you're thinking about uh, on social media? She was afraid like there's going to be a test, and that's why I had her sitting there. But it's not. It's to, uh, to amplify what I'm saying, to fact check, and, to, uh, and to, to help all of us. And that's why Hansen's also there. But uh, go ahead, Monica. Do you want to uh, just talk yeah, a little bit? Yeah. Um, off the cuff, gee. Uh, mm -hmm. I think a lot of you would agree that social isn't quite as new as it used to be. Um, three, four years ago, when I first started thinking about all this, it was just so new and so unfamiliar to so many people. And now we're at a time where best practices have definitely come about. 
where brands as well as people, uh, you know, have a pretty good idea about things like how to get started, how to find followers, how to, you know, connect with other people, how to, how to join and become part of expandable, uh, evolving conversations that social media seems to be so good at capturing. So it's kind of in a mature stage. Um, and then you get things like, I don't know if you guys saw, but uh, what was it, a, several weeks ago, was it the Burger King account that was hacked? And then it looked like it was McDonald's. Anyway, so there's there's all these security kinds of things, and and and, and you know businesses uh, live and die by social media. Um, some people would argue that you know people can too. That the personalities you create on social media, uh, what do you say on social media? Are, is it public or is it private? Is anything ever really private? There's so many questions uh, with all of that. Then the introduction of location-aware technology <laughs> into social media. When are you comfortable saying where you are and what you're doing? Um, but I really focus on all of the promising aspects of it and how incredibly fun it, it is. Um, just tonight, I think I met at least one person who I'd known on Twitter but didn't know in real life, and I love making those connections. So I feel like my, um, my life has been kind of enriched by, <laughs> by the things I do in social media. I think some of you might agree. Uh, so it's, it's just really, really exciting space, and it is mature, uh, and so there's a lot of you know, entrenched issues to talk about. That's terrific. Thank you. And uh, just to please encourage you to follow Monica. She's at Monica Guzman. And, Moni Guzman. Uh, Moni Guzman, yeah. Moni Guzman, I'm sorry. At Moni Guzman. And if you haven't um, seen what she's done with her bio, that's the kind of the first tip for today, is to optimize your bio. And go ahead and look at how specific she is about what she does. And she's given a lot of shout outs to other people with her Twitter handles. And that's, that's a really good good thing to do. Uh, let me go to Hanson here. Hanson, how much time do you kind of, you know, you, you're doing a lot of different things. Social isn't just your focus, but talk a little bit about how you use it and, and what you tell your students about it. Yeah, I, I use social more for syndication distribution. I'm not, as am, I'm not as enthusiastic as I used to be about social media. I mean, Sri was actually one of the people who introduced me to a lot of the platforms when they were first coming on board, including, I think, MySpace. I remember you first telling me about MySpace, and then... <laughs> Uh, he's really big on MySpace <laughs> and LinkedIn. Huge, huge. Um, And so um, I've actually become a lot more careful. This stuff's become so pervasive that, uh, as Monica said, you actually have to think about best practices now. But at the same time, I'm really wary of the business models that both Facebook and Twitter are trying to promote and all these new platforms. And so what I've done is become a lot more cautious in terms of how I use the different uh, channels. And the one that I've really decided to invest in, because I think it matters most for what I do, is LinkedIn. And that's the one I'm growing. I'm really impressed by how they've actually gone and taken that as a publishing platform. There's some really useful stuff there. So I spent a lot more time there. While Facebook, I really kept it very limited because I just don't trust them anymore. So I think we're actually heading into sort of mid-lives for a lot of these platforms. Um, and um, you know, I try not to get too focused on them, but, but think more about strategically where do they sort of fall into the pantheon. And for me, as a content creator, you want to get people's attention first with really unique, outstanding content that you've, either you've created or shared. And then after that, look at how to use those channels to spread the word. But I really want that stuff to reside in my control on my site first before I start using those channels. So one of my friends uh, has this great line. And by the way, throughout the session tonight, I'm going to ask you to name check people. Name check means I mention somebody and you tweet at them. You say, hey, at so and so, we're talking about you at Seattle here in, uh, you know, at, at, uh, at, the, at the conference or whatever. Just think of a way of doing that. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to do the first of the name checks at Jim Rosenberg. Jim Rosenberg is, uh, has one of the coolest jobs in the world. Anybody know him here? So Jim Rosenberg is the head of social media for the World Bank. And his Twitter handle is at Jim Rosenberg. You want to get to know him. But he has a great line. He says, social media is your embassy, and your website is your home country. Right? Meaning you've got to have all these presences in various embassies. You've got to have the various embassies in various countries. But you, it all has to go home. And in his case, you know, he's sending stuff back to his brand. Also, look how he's branded at HRH Media. But go ahead and say hi to Jim Rosenberg and you will uh, like connecting with him. I just want to also give a shout out to Hansen's book. It's called Storyteller Uprising, Truth and Persuasion in the Digital Age. Fantastic book. And I encourage you to uh, find it on, at, at Amazon, I guess, and other places, and, and take a look. So are you all ready to get started? Yes? yes. All right. So here's what we're going to do. How many of you have been in a one-night stand before? I mean, a social media one-night stand. <laughs> 
I know you, you know, there's an awkward thing, right? Social media, one night stand. Uh, the social media is the important part here. And I have my social media one night stand kit over here. Uh, how do you prepare for a one night stand? You gotta have some coffee, right? Uh, of course you need some kisses. <laughs> Altoids, very important. And uh, some Tootsie Roll. But mainly how you prepare is by having an open mind. An open mind is what I want you all to have. And the fact that you came here, if, I don't know how many of you told your friends you're actually going to learn something about Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn on a beautiful night in, in Seattle. I hear they're very, very rare. Uh, and you are coming out. So what we're going to do is to give you a lot of new ideas. And therefore, I hope you've brought a notebook and are taking a ton of notes as we're going along. All I ask is if you do tweet, please use hash Seattle. There's a prize for the first person who can notice if we've, uh, if we've trended in Seattle. We've done this uh, in other places I've been to. We have trended. Let's see if we can make us trend in Seattle. In fact, if we have 200 people tweeting, we can trend. So there's a prize for the first person who notices or sends me a screen grab that uh, we have, in fact, trended. But let's see if we can all work together and do that together. Uh, one of the thoughts that I have about social media is what I call ABC, always be collecting. And that means you're always looking around for gathering information or items or data that you can use on your social media work. So the thing that you use for that is, of course, your smartphone. And all of us have that. I want you to pull out your smartphone. And throughout the session today, if you see something that's interesting, you take a picture. You collect it. And then you decide what you want to do with it at another point. You don't have to share everything, right? So always be collecting. Share as appropriate is one of the, my mantras about being a journalist, being a media person. Because at some point in your life, you're going to happen, have, you're going to walk, come across something that's a world exclusive. How are you going to be able to capture that and then share it with the world? Do you know how to do that? And the only way you know how is to practice, practice, practice. So I'm going to give you an example of a, uh, of a, uh, a friend of mine. Um, she became a friend of mine from social media named E.F. Stewart, at E.F. Stewart, S-T-E-W-A-R-T, who works at Kramer Books. Anybody familiar with that down in D.C.? It's one of the best uh, bookstores, independent bookstores in America. And she came up to Columbia to take classes in social media like this, but over four nights. And she didn't understand what she exactly she was learning. What was, what was this building up toward? And then one day, the first family came shopping at Kramer Books. And all her social media learning was for that moment, <laughs> right? One day, the equivalent of that is going to happen to you. That, you know, the first family is going to come shopping at your store or some terrible, horrible thing is going to happen in front of you. Do you know how to react, how to capture it, how to amplify it, how to get it out there? That's one of the lessons that we're going to do, we're going to work on today. But for that, you have to capture it in the first place. So please take out your phones. You see something, come up, take a photograph, take pictures of people around you, uh, take pictures of name tags. There's so many interesting things you can do. You can decide to share when you want, but collect it first. And also, don't sit in your seats all night. Uh, get up, walk around, bring the camera up and take a picture. Be uh, less shy than you might be at, uh, at a session. We are going to go about two and a half straight hours, maybe a little longer, and that means, you know, if you, if you sit for a long time, it'll be uh, not good for you. Uh, we will take a short break, maybe 15 minutes. We'll see how it, uh, how it goes. Um, any questions before we start? Yes. How do you organize uh, the photographs? Well, unfortunately, I'm on the iPhone, and unfortunately, there are no easy ways to organize your photographs, right? They're all just in one long... Uh, pile here, and that's one of the things I wish uh, was a little different on, uh, on this, and we can talk a little bit about that. I'm going to actually do a section that I call app advice, and we're going to share ad, uh, uh, tips on uh, new apps or good apps that we should all know. So let me just walk you through a couple of things to just orient you to this. Some of you heard me playing music earlier, and I was playing a tool, I was playing a website called vidijam.com. Has anyone seen this? So here are 200 people, no one's seen this, vidijam.com. And what it does is, I call it Pandora for YouTube. <laughs> Did you instantly get it? You understood what that means, right? Five years ago, if I said Pandora for YouTube, you'd be like, huh? What are you talking about? Because Pandora didn't mean much, YouTube didn't mean much. But now you know instantly what it does, that you can say 
play only Bob Marley or play music like Bob Marley. It's in fact a little better than Pandora because you can't force it in Pandora to play a certain song. And then you can hit next. It's got all these social ac actions here. You can tweet it, Amazon it, iTunes it, donate, etc. It's a fun little tool. Again, as I name check things, tweet at them, mention them, tell them that, you're, you, that we're talking about it here. And it's called Vidi Jam, and you can check that out. So that was one of the things I was doing. Also want to um, show you a new site that's new to me called Tagboard. Are there people from Tagboard here tonight uh, in the back? And maybe you'll get a chance to say hello to them. Tagboard collects your social media, all the Seattle tweets, and puts them in this very neat board that you can look. Here are the tweets. Uh, let's see if anyone's done an Instagram yet. No Instagrams. Come on, folks. You can, you can do better than that. Let's see if there's any Facebooks, no, not yet. No Vines and no Google Plus. So everything's on Twitter, but you, will, uh, you can go in and do that. It's called tagboard slash, tagboard.com slash Seattle if you want to see this. Go back and look at it later. And here's another tool called Seesaw. And this is just constantly pulling up the tweets that are going by, right? So it's called Seesaw. The ad address is S-E-E-S -E -E dot A-W, Seesaw, S-E-E-S -E -E dot A-W is the handle. So I want you to take notes. You don't have to jump into everything that I show you, but you have to kind of keep track of the ones that, uh, that, that might interest you, and you can then pause it, share it, retweet it, et cetera, right from there. The other tool that I really like for displaying tweets is called Visible Tweets, and many of you know that. Uh, Visible Tweets produces this very nice, easy to look at, um, Let's see here, like this, you hit go. And then the par part I like is under animation, the tag cloud, you have several options, but I like, I don't like that one, I like tag cloud. And watch how it comes very strong, uh, uh, ones like this. I don't know if that's a photograph that they've, somebody's posted, but you're seeing here, this is a tag cloud that'll eventually show up here as they, as they do it. So uh, definitely check that out. See Vidi Jam, very nice, my, at my phone, you saw what she did there. Seattle, Pandora, Vidi Jam, YouTube, right? As you speak, it will start filling up. Now, one of the things that happens is never do this. When someone's speaking, do not run the tweets in the back because it's very irritating and it's also very confusing. Like, I'm standing up here and saying, you know, and uh, it was such a serious moment, the most deepest, darkest night of my life, and there's somebody posting about the food they just ate, right? And people start laughing. So do not do this. Always play this portion during breaks or during the setup, but also use it as a way to encourage people to jump in and use the, use the tool. So definitely check this out, and that's visible tweets, and we can kind of come back to them as necessary. Uh, want to remind you that we have uh, all, all our slides that I'm about to show you on bit.ly slash Seattle, and the live video is on livestream.com slash mcdm. Later on, I will update the slides so that you have the video, uh, the, uh, the archived video. And what these two lovely people here are going to do is help us by, um, by talk, speaking up if there's something that I, I get wrong or something that they want to add to the conversation. And what I want to do to start, as with any event, is to start by tweeting something so that people can uh, see what we're doing. And so uh, this is me writing a tweet that you're about to watch. There's nothing more boring than watching someone tweet. <laughs> At 10 p.m., Hansen is having a paint drying watching session, so if you'd like to come to that. Um, I'm starting my social, oops, social media one night stand in um, Seattle. Watch uh, via at, uh, wait, what is it? It's live stream. Dot com, live stream dot com. I told you this is boring, slash M C D M, correct? Uh, and slides at Bitly, and by the way, Bitly is one of the most underappreciated tools in all of journalism, and we'll, we'll show you why in a bit. Sri Atoll, um, and, and tweets via hash Sri Atoll. Okay, let's see if I can get this all in there. Uh, now I've gone over, right? So what am I going to do? I'm going to remove this and say, here we go, starting still too long. So I'm going to do this. I spend between three and six minutes on every tweet I write. I don't have a real life, right? <laughs> but why do I do that? 
give me a second. Is this okay? What do you think? This, this looks all right? Now I'm going to send this, but I wince every time I tweet. I am actually physically ill every time I have to tweet. Not ill, but at least the hair on the back of my neck stands up out of fear when I'm doing this. So is missing an E, missing a what? Three adults. No, this is stray adult. All right, three adult. Thank you. See, that's why I have to double check. That's why I take six minutes. Ready? Oh. Oh, and then I've three adults spell right now? Okay. Okay, everything okay? Wait, what capital what? One night. No, I don't know. Where are the grammarians? Does the knight need an end cap? <laughs> where the where are the SPJ people? Come on. Where are the Saja people? AJ people. Doesn't nothing like having two hundred editors, people. This is so much fun. Okay, ready? I am nervous and I'm gonna do this. Oh, it's gone. All right. Why do I care so much about this? Because social media is the only thing I do every day that can get me fired today. Social media is the only thing I do every day that can get me divorced today. And social media is the only thing I ever do that will be in the library of Congress, right? How many people didn't know that your tweets are in the library of Congress? Raise your hand, no shame here. A lot of people, right? So now you're like, oh my God, what do I do? What are all those messages I sent? And that's part of why we're here together, to learn how we can use some of these tools better. Why do I have this Nutella background, anybody know? There was a really cool story, scary story, funny story out of New York. Uh, Nicole knows that. She's at Religion Beat, Belief Beat in the back. There's Nicole at Belief Beat, if you want to say hello to her. And Nicole uh, knows that at Columbia there was a story that they, the dining services was spending $5,000 a week on Nutella. And I was like, $5,000 a week? We spend that in my house. I mean, what, you know, in one week, no problem. Uh, that's how much we love Nutella. But and I know that you teach communications here, Hanson, what they did, uh, the PR office, because it turns out it was actually $450 worth of Nutella in all of dining services. They created a, a very funny response as a press release. So that's the one over there, bit.ly slash CU Nutella, if you want to take a look at it. I'm just going to click through so you can see that. And they had a very, uh, I thought, interesting approach to this, including a fake quote from me. And look at this, Nutella gate exposed, it's a smear. Or as we say in New York, it's a schmear, right? And there's alma mater, and then there was a quote from me, a fake quote from me at the bottom that you can see right there, right? They kind of had fun with it. Hanson, what do you think about, uh, you do a lot of crisis management uh, stuff. What, what are your thoughts, not necessarily about this, but? Well, I think, I mean, it was smart. They basically, first of all, you're taking, it's the currency, right? You're taking uh, advantage of the attention that's being momentarily paid to this. So you right. want to do it right. But humor is also a sensitive thing. I mean, Oreo also did a great job during the Super Bowl of taking advantage of that particular opportunity. So I think this was the right thing to do, and they did it well. But to execute is, is a sensitive thing. And it, and it, can, it can go wrong. Mon did Monique you see uh, uh, the Republican response to the State of the Union, Marco Rubio's water bottle thing? Yes. Yeah. The, his official Twitter account tweeted a picture of, of, I think it was Poland Spring water bottle, and everybody thought, you know, wow, instead of just staying quiet and kind of sitting in the back hoping this just all blows over, he yeah. made himself part of the joke. That's, that's, that's a great way to think about that. And here, 11 of you retweeted it. I'd urge all of you to retweet this to your audience so that you can all, uh, so your audience can benefit from seeing all this stuff. Uh, I will, by the way, uh, how I will be doing this, I'll show you some slides. And then I'll walk through several different platforms, the Facebook, the Twitter, the LinkedIn, et cetera. And as we uh, do that, at the very end, I will give you my social media success formula. And I always leave it to the very end, because otherwise people will leave. So I try to keep you here uh, as long as I possibly can. So let me see if I can get you into these slides. OK, and here we go. Uh, just I want to give you my contact information so that you have it. It's 3.net. 3 at 3.net is my email address. I hope this is the first of many conversations we have about social. And uh, it is not 3.com, which is a chain of motels in Florida. And <laughs> so it's very important that you know the difference. I also a have place two. place for one night stands. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, let's, let's see how, how many bad one night stand jokes we can make, right? Uh, that was a good one. Uh, <laughs> So you say, Hansel. Facebook.com slash 3tips is my business profile and my, or my business page, or I hate the term fan page. And then Facebook.com slash 3net is my personal Facebook presence. And I uh, encourage you to look at that. I also have a social media guide, which is bit.ly slash 3soc. 
So you can take a look at that. And of course, please take out your cameras and uh, film stuff as you, as you need. As you heard from Hansen, there, there, you know, I have two professions as an educator and as a journalist. And the journalist profession has been completely disrupted. And now it's happening in education, as he pointed out. And everyone know this guy? It's not our cousin. You might think it's Hansen's cousin or my cousin, but this is somebody else. Everyone in America should know this guy. He's Sal Khan of Khan Academy. And his Twitter handle is at Sal Khan Academy. Tweet at him. Uh, why is he important? Because he's completely disrupting education. Since he quit his job four years ago to do this, he has uh, made 4,000, his company has made 4,000 videos and uh, 250 million views of his videos. Uh, everything from uh, calculus to art history and is just fantastic what he has done. Bill Gates saw it, gave him a couple million bucks and other, uh, Carlos Slim gave him money to translate it all. If you have children in your life above fourth grade, they know about this or they should know about it. The state of Idaho is doing a 10,000 student pilot where they're just working with Khan Academy and uh, Stanford Medical School is outsourcing all its lectures to private, customized uh, Khan Academy videos. They call it lectures without lecture halls. And it's just a fascinating thing. And I do a lot of talking and thinking now about, uh, uh, about online ed, but that's not what we're here to discuss today. But I will mention two other names you should know in this space. The other is Coursera, at Coursera, where you can take uh, hundreds of classes from uh, all kinds of great universities from around the world. That started at Stanford. And at um, uh, and another is called edX, edX.org, uh, Coursera.com. Uh, edX.com is all about, uh, is from Harvard and MIT uh, folks. And you can take classes there as well from a bunch of different universities, all free. It's unimaginable that that would happen. And Harvard and MIT never cooperate because they fight like heck but they are together thinking about this. And I want you to just be aware of that. And has anyone here taken a Coursera course or an edX course? You must check it out just to see what it's like and, uh, and where all of this is, uh, is going. So that's called, then this guy is Sal Khan. Those of you who know your Bollywood know that there is a, not an Indian actor named Salman Khan also. And he's one of the world's most famous people among Bollywood aficionados. And I like to say that one day he'll be known as the other Salman Khan, because this guy is the one who's going to be famous. Let's look at this graphic, which shows you uh, how long it took things to get 50 million, new platform to hit 50 million users, because 50 million is a great critical mass number. And if your cameras aren't able to click from back there, just walk up, there's some great seats up here, or come on stage, sit next to Hansen and take a picture, no problem. Or take a picture of Hansen. Uh, <laughs> It took the telephone 75 years, it took the radio 38, it took television 13, it took the web four, and it took Facebook three and a half years, right, to hit 50 million, because it's, that's a very good critical mass number. All the way down you can see it took Draw Something. Anybody here a Draw Something fan? Draw Something took 50 days, and it took Angry Birds Space, which is different from Angry Birds, and different from Angry Birds Star Wars, 35 days to hit that. And some of you are looking at this, eagle-eyed people are looking at this and say, gee, is this the former Secretary General of the United Nations? Is that what happens to them? Do they become uh, creators of graphics about uh, social media? And the answer is no. This is another guy with the same name, but he gets the best restaurant reservations anywhere near the UN. But tweet at him and say, hey, add G. Kofi Annan, we're talking about you. Uh, one of the mnemonics I heard about how to remember his name is it's, at, it's like Sophie Cannon is Kofi Annan, that's how you remember his name. And uh, what I like about this is it shows you kind of it took time, partly because of technology and uh, the infrastructure, but look how fast things are moving now. That means somebody starting an app somewhere in the world can have it out there and be seen by the world. A lot of things we talk about are so American-centric and that's fine, but I love highlighting non-American social and digital tools and apps, and obviously like Spotify and Skype are not American, neither is Angry Birds, right? You know that, that's from Scandinavia. So thinking about these changes is gonna be very important. What I tell people is you don't need to be first on any of these networks. You should be thinking instead, I need to be an early tester, late adopter of technology. Early tester, late adopter. There's no reason to be first. 
And I wasn't first on any of these tools. At Columbia, we got Facebook fairly early, but I didn't join right away. I was like, I've got email, that's all I need. And I didn't join. Uh, Twitter, uh, I, I, I saw Twitter, but I was like, you know, I made an account, but I didn't use it. And it was one of my students, a guy named Franz Strasser, who dragged me kicking and screaming onto Twitter. And he's an example of this kind of internationalization of social media. And you might want to give him a, a shout out. Let me just uh, put his uh, Twitter handle here. Why do you do that, Tree? I mean, even, yeah, though, sure. even though you mentioned that timing in terms of when you do sure. want to adopt, there's also something about brand protection that even when a social media platform pops up, I do sign up fairly early just to make sure that the name that I want to take is taken, just in case it does go supernova. You don't want to lose it to somebody else along that's the way. That's a brilliant, brilliant uh, suggestion. Just that's that testing. Moni, do you uh, have a similar thought? And did you join Twitter right away or did you wait? Uh, I joined it in April 2007 because I heard it was something and then didn't take it seriously until my boyfriend, now husband, told me to try it again in October. So <laughs> I credit him. That's great. Is he here tonight? He's not. He's at home with the baby. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, this is Franz Strasser. Give him a shout out or say hi to him on Twitter. And uh, he is so interesting. He's a German who uh, graduated from Columbia as a class valedictorian and then uh, works for the BBC explaining America to the world. And, uh, and, he, and this is true globalization, and he's fantastic, and he's, he's Franz Strasser, one word, on, on Twitter. So definitely uh, check him out. The other thing I say when I'm looking at this graphic is that we want to keep an open mind. We've been talking about that, right? But see, how does it fit into two critical things for you? Does it fit into your workflow and your life flow? That's how you know if a tool is going to be successful and make sense for you. If it only fits in one of those, you're not going to use it. Think about email. It has to workflow and life flow. It's very, very important. And another uh, thought I have is this idea that you have to be first is just not possible because you can't be. So if, uh, if I told you all that um, I was the 14 millionth person to join Twitter, you would be like, well, I'm not listening to you about any of this, right? 14 millionth person. How do you find out what your number is on Twitter? Anybody know? How do you do that? If you use an app called TweetBot, they publish it right at the bottom of what number you were on Twitter. There's a way to look it up for LinkedIn as well, and that tells you what number you were on this. And 14 million is pretty bad, uh, as you, as, as, as you could uh, think about that. Let's look at this photograph. Why was this photograph so famous? This is, you all know, the most tweeted photograph in history, the most liked photograph in history. Now let's not get carried away. History is since 2004 and 2006, not for forever. But the, 2000s, the Twitter is this week, you all know that, right? That it all happened this week was when the first tweet was created at, uh, uh, in 2006. So this photograph was is very Ill, uh, important at understanding what has happened in social. And when you look at this, this was how the Obama administration, Obama campaign announced their, the win, uh, that they had won. It's fascinating to see how quickly things changed in four years. Four years earlier, they did not use Twitter or Facebook to announce that they had, um, they had won. What, did the, what tool did they use? Anybody? Somebody? SMS, right? Text messaging is what they used. Four years later, they're using Twitter. And when you look at this, several lessons here. One of them is the importance of photographs. And that's why I encourage you, pick out your cameras and just take pictures. Throw them up on Instagram or just keep them for yourself, but keep using that camera to take pictures. If you're worried like I am that you'll lose power, which is always my worry, you know, borrow some juice from one of your friends. We're all at a one night stand, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> The other, so pictures, so you're gonna see when we talk about Facebook a little later, how big the Facebook pictures are getting, right? You all heard about this? Really big photographs on Facebook. And that, that has had an impact. Uh, this was a user-led uh, um, revamp of Facebook because readers were responding to the big pictures and they are now going to the big pictures as you will see. The other thing that when I look at this, uh, people, one of the biggest complaints about social media is that social media is a beast and you've got to feed it all the time. It's absolutely true, but I like to think of social media as a goat. Why a goat? Because goats eat old stuff. They eat old content. It is absolutely important in breaking news and typical news situations to have the freshest possible content. 
but we underestimate the value of archival material, of representative material, of things that give you a sense of something without being the actual thing. And this is an example of it. This is not November in Chicago inside a hotel at 10 p.m., right? What is this? This is outdoors in Ohio in August. And that's what you're seeing here, that they took the picture that was representative in their minds. You may have read about this, that they had a choice. It was this one or flip side, where it was a picture of, uh, of Michelle, and, and you would see only the back of Barack on that. Uh, by the way, you know that Michelle Obama has joined Twitter. What is her, just in the last couple of weeks, what is her Twitter handle? FLOTUS, right? F-L-O-T-U-S, First Lady of the United States. Big mistake by Michelle Obama. Why was this a mistake? This was a case of the bureaucrats who run the First Lady's office running amok. Because she doesn't know any better, she accepted that it be FLOTUS. What's going to happen when she leaves office? She's going to be a young woman when she leaves office, and she's going to have to leave all those followers behind. Right? That's a problem. And that's the kind of thing that you should be thinking about. If you work in a news organization, think about, unless they force you to put their initials on your name, do not put your, build your brand around the place where you work unless it's, you think it's really worthwhile. Uh, uh, Somebody else said this, putting your organ employer's name is like tattooing your boyfriend's name on your arm, right? And it may work out, we hope it works out. It worked out for Moni, but uh, it doesn't always work out. And the other big disaster about this is what will happen when Bill Clinton joins that office? <laughs> ah, some of you get it, all right. So that's gonna be a major uh, problem in that office. Uh, but anyway, the other, Thing that I learned from this is this had more than I think two million likes on Facebook two million likes or four million likes but the same photo posted on Facebook four years earlier had zero likes why was that anybody know because the like button had not been invented it wasn't invented till March of 2009 and think about how the like button is something we use every day in journalism did not even exist four years ago that's how fast things just fit in and become part of our lives. So let me pause here and uh, talk to uh, our two uh, folks out here. I feel like this meet the press or something, but Moni, uh, any thoughts as you look at this or any of the things I said? Just kind of jump in if you would like to add something. Um, I mean, gosh, it's all over. Uh, when, I, when I heard about this being the most you know, retweeted photo, uh, one of the things I think of is how powerful and influential and important emotion is in social media. Um, I hear this a lot with Facebook in particular, that Twitter is uh, you know, some place where people like to share you know, quick links and things like that and photos. Emotion really carries everywhere, but on Facebook in particular, they went for a very, very emotional shot. I mean, when you, when you look at the text of the tweet, it could be anything. Um, yeah. It really could be anything, but they clearly went for where, where's the emotion that we think most people can really get behind. Nice, very cool. So that's why we have her to, uh, to help me here. And what uh, struck me about this from my point of view is that there, there's, they could have had a problem here with authenticity because I think a lot of people could have easily said, that doesn't look like that was taken the night of the election, as you right. mentioned. It wasn't in Chicago. And so, you know, was this canned? Was this ready to go all along? And yeah, it's great that it was liked, but it feels like part of the PR campaign. But I think because of what Monica said is that because it captures such a beautiful emotion, this is why people were willing to overlook that right. and still see it as authentic. The other thing is look at what The Economist did. They could have picked any picture, but they used this because they hoped it would trigger little inspiration when you're walk looking at the cover. Maybe you'd buy it because you saw it already. And that's what you see here. And then they remixed it, right? You saw they did a mashup, now hug a Republican. Well, people took that and put it on Tumblr and said, now hug an environmentalist. Now, you know, and now hug a whatever, you know, you could build your own story out of this. And that's new and that's kind of fun as well. This is a time of a lot of media experimentation, as you know. And look on the right. This is the Associated Press. And they did a sponsored tweet, you know this, at, and, uh, at CES. And what I loved about this is look at the bottom, if you can see it, uh, some person named Sati says, at AP, you can't be serious, bro. And it's like, yo, you can't be serious. So the, here's this, some person being able to talk directly to the Associated Press. That's the new world we live in. And then on the left, you know, you're familiar with this, they discovered there are thousands, millions of printers not being used for news, and they decided to use it. What are they doing now? These are restaurant credit card receipts. And in a hotel, in, an, in a restaurant in 
uh, Washington, when you get your bill, you get the latest AP wire built in. And some of you might think this is the coolest thing ever, and some of you might be horrified. I did, you know, on Twitter, you often see things, but you don't follow up. And I saw a headline about a toaster that put that toasts burns onto your toast the latest uh, headlines. I don't know if that is true. If someone wants to look it up and let us know if that, in fact, is a real thing or like a fake thing. Um, but this is the world we're living in, where we're doing a lot of experimentation. Uh, some of you remember this giant uh, hashtag, the largest hashtag probably in the history of magazines. And it was for the final issue. But I love the way it, the, it's juxtaposed against what you see in the background with the Newsweek uh, building and an old, old New York photo, right? But now I'm going to share with you the dirty secret of social media, and I'm going to give you a second to pull out your cameras and take a picture of this. So you're looking at this and say, gee, this is why I signed up for four hours of insanity on a nice Monday night. Uh, if this is true, why the heck am I doing this? What is the point, right? Well, this is absolutely true, that almost everyone will miss almost everything you do on social media. And that should give you a sense. So you might say then, gee, why, Sri, are you so careful if everyone's going to miss? The rule I've learned is they, if, you make, if you screw up, everyone will see it. But if you have this very carefully crafted, beautiful tweet that's going to change the world, nobody will see it. And that's the, the, we need a law for that. I don't know what we'll call it. But if you look at this, almost everyone will miss almost everything. Why is that? The reason is there are just too much social media. And one way to quantify that is it took Twitter three and a half years to hit the first billion tweets. Now they hit a billion tweets every two and a half days. This is too much. There's just no way you can, you can uh, see all that stuff. Let me give you another example in another medium completely. Uh, by the way, if you share this, I promise people will notice. Many people have told me the most retweets they ever got was for either video, I mean a photo of this, or just typing this content into Twitter and posting it with a hash Seattle. Please do that. But almost everyone will miss almost everything you do. Think about this in the news business. In the news business, uh, in the newspaper business, uh, some of you remember the story of the mosque near Ground Zero that was going to be built. Does everybody remember this story? This was in uh, November of 2009, was broken by my student on the front page of the New York Times. And the student's name is Sharaf Mawjood, uh, who is actually now the vice president of Saja. And his Twitter handle is just Mawjood. Uh, oops, I always type, make typos here. But um, he's, the, he's the new Saja vice president. He's at NBC now. And um, this is his uh, Twitter handle. Let's just go up here. That's him. So if you want to say hello to him, he works at Rock Center, the show that you know. Mm -hmm. And he broke this on the front page of the New York Times and barely made a blip. Some people noticed it was an interesting story. But it wasn't until the following May when Sarah Palin, if you remember her, went on the Laura Ingram show and called it a victory mosque and all these terrible things that it kind of caught fire and everybody paid attention. So one of the lessons is the importance of influencers in your lives. And I'm going to show you a tool to find those influencers. And one of the reasons why we think about this is that you can be on the front page of the New York Times but not have the impact until an influencer takes it and accelerates it out there in the media space. And there are many, many examples of that. But what we have to be thinking about as, as, as journalists and media people is, are we doing every single thing we can to accelerate this and get it out there? Um, I've been on the Today Show 40 times. I bet no one here has ever seen me on TV. I've been on CNN a lot. No one's ever seen me on TV, right? It's, uh, you know, I'm on TV every week, and uh, obviously some people watch me, but no one, you know, no one at my office watches me, and I realize no one at my home, on my home watches me. <laughs> and uh, by the way, my wife and kids are here. This is a family vacation that I'm spending with you all, so if you want to do a nice uh, hello and a thank you to my wife, I'm sure she would appreciate it. Uh, she's stuck somewhere in... Uh, Bellevue with uh, two, ten, two nine and a half year olds. Uh, please, someone watch this, uh, the the um, the uh, the police scanners in case they're you know causing havoc anywhere. But her Twitter handle is at Rupa Online if you want to say hello to her. But 
So I one day came home and she promised that she would make them watch my segment on local station in New York. And I came home and she said, you know, well, we were flipping the channels and we came across the penguins of Madagascar. <laughs> and we picked the penguins over daddy, right? That's the world we live in where we think we can just get on the Today Show, our product will sell and we'll be great. It is just not the case. You have to work hard. I have this idea that I, I, I want to do a workshop I call no one's going to see your tweets, or nobody cares. <laughs> That's a problem, right? <laughs> Let me add, go to our uh, expert panel here. Any thoughts on this? You don't always have to respond if you don't have something, but if you want to jump in, please do. I'm too busy tweeting. Oh, okay. 